Hey, welcome to the Backyard Professor videos. I have another really interesting subject that I'm going to give you the answer to right now up front. Here is the issue. Mormon scholars and Mormon apologists are continuing to cheat with the evidence. They are continuing to only carefully select materials that justify the conclusions of what they believe. They already have a belief. All of their research leads them carefully to that end belief as if the evidence legitimately leads you to their belief. So all you have to do is believe what they say, read their materials, and voila, join the church just like they belong to it. And this is fundamentally dishonest. Now let me present the evidence again with one of the uh, new apologists. And I call him new. I should say the most prominent at this point. I don't know if he's new at it or not. He's been at it for quite a while. He has quite a few publications to his name. Uh, Terrell Givens. This one is his book, The Pearl of Greatest Price. Mormonism's most controversial scripture. Now, this one he wrote with Brian M. Hauglid, and I believe this is Oxford University Press. Again, uh, Oxford really likes publishing Givens, and Givens is finally starting to put some Mormon apologetic material in with the scholarly publishers, university presses, which is really impressive. Uh, yeah, 2019, so we're not talking uh, 30, 40 year old stuff that's out of date. We're talking just recently. Gibbons is a very careful rhetorician. Now, in a way, and I, 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 I'm not trying to insult the man because he's published way more than I ever will. So, I mean, he's vastly more accomplished in the scholarly field, I think, than I will ever become. So, I mean, give the man credit where credit is due. That still doesn't take away from the flaw of him being a careful, sneaky rhetorician, wherein he will, he will give you some truth, and he will give you some sources that are pro-Mormon, and then he'll bring in a few sources that are not pro-Mormon, that disagree with these guys, and yet in the long run, he still carefully selects his materials from both sides. Interestingly enough here, from both the Mormon apologists and the Mormon scholars, and from the Egyptologists, who are vehemently disagreeing with the Mormon scholars. And he's giving us both sides, which gives us the sense, uh, the feeling, the impression that Givens is being objective. And so he kind of helps put you at ease. He kind of helps uh, you drop your guard Wham! And then he gives you a quick right hook. <laughs> clever boy, but only half clever. Because there are some of us lesser academic published and lesser academic accomplished people who still nonetheless read like a bat out of heck and try to keep up with as much as we know how, and we spend 
tens of thousands of dollars on our own libraries ourselves, and we read them. So, we're not like the Chapa Mormons, who just read the fluff and agree with everything every pro-Mormon says, because of course, they have no interest in telling anything but the truth, right? No, this is not chapel ex-Mormonism either. This is not chapel non-Mormonism either. This is, let's get down, let's get serious, let's check sources. Let's analyze the, the manner in which the argument is put together and see where Terrell Gibbons is using the sources in less than a realistic manner than he ought to be. He's more honest. He's a little bit more open. He is a little bit more uh, conclusive and all-inclusive than some of the other more, for lack of a better way to describe them, these Orthodox apologists who just are so blatantly, ridiculously off kilter that you can catch them in just a heartbeat. Now, Givens is a bit more nuanced. He's a bit more uh, philosophically wise. He's a bit, oh, what do you say, historically informed. And yet, the conclusion I am unfortunately going to have to come to after I present you the evidence that I have gathered together on this particular discussion that Givens is giving is, unfortunately, Givens is still sneaking in faith-promoting, um, what, scholarship, goodness, testimony, where, honestly, uh, a more complete look at the very sources he himself uses shows that there is no faithful conclusion to come to. So, all right, I've, I've gone around now for five minutes, but now you know what the video is about. Let me present you with the evidence in a very honestly open, clear-cut, boink, 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 piece by piece evidence and show you why for me now and there may be some of you who read this book and I would encourage you to read the book really truly and who will disagree with my assessment and that is perfectly fine I don't care if you agree with me or not I'm showing you why I just can't agree with Terrell Gibbons because the evidence doesn't quite give such an optimistic end that he arrives at. Givens in his chapter on the Book of Abraham, on page, where am I, 153, I will just read this. This is actually a concluding paragraph in a a concluding paragraph in a concluding section. Fact simile number three in the book of Abraham presents perhaps the greatest challenges to Smith's defenders since in this instance he translates actual Egyptian characters, not scenes or symbols. He has just finished discussing facsimile number two with Joseph Smith's translation of basically an interpretation of the figures and facsimile number one, which he again is interpreting the figures. Facsimile three is a different animal, according to Givens, right? So, in this instance, he translates actual Egyptian characters, not scenes or symbols. For instance, he interprets facsimile 2 as King Pharaoh, whose name is given in the characters above his head. 
figure four means prince of Pharaoh and king of Egypt as written above his hand. And figure five means Shulam, one of the king's principal waiters as represented by the characters above his hand. However, both Rhodes, and he's talking about Michael Dennis Rhodes, an LDS scholar who has studied Egyptian uh, as an apologist. I was calling him an LDS Egyptologist. Uh, scholar is more accurate. He's certainly done a lot more work. He knows the language better than I do, but not as good as Robert Rittner does. So I, I'm going to call him an LDS scholar, Michael Dennis Rhodes. That is who the Rhodes is here. So both Rhodes and Rittner, Robert K. Rittner, translate those same characters as, quote, Isis the Great, the God's mother, unquote. The next figure is, quote, Mot, Mistress of the Gods. Unquote. This is what the Egyptian hieroglyphs are actually saying, is what both Michael Dennis Rhodes and Robert Rittner are saying. And then the third uh, figure, figure five, which Joseph Smith called Shulam, actually translates as, quote, the Osiris whore justified forever, unquote. So if Smith was indeed in some oracular manner deciphering elements originating with Abraham in the papyri he possessed, the consensus is that his powers apparently failed him when it came to the actual translation of Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, at least in this case, he says. He also notes, Gibbon says, no LDS Egyptologist disputes the standard translations of those particular symbols, and they are quite unlike Smith's rendering. The majority of scholarly opinion, in some, is dismissive of Smith as an explainer of the three facsimiles. Regarding his efforts as a translator of particular glyphs, the consensus finds even fewer dissenters from the nearly universal rejection. In some, little has changed from the early night from the early 20th century assessment which Gibbons presented earlier. So facsimile number three is problematical, and the hieroglyphs that Joseph Smith is talking about translating in the facsimile number three, uh, he did not get correct. And both the LDS scholars, Michael Dennis Rhodes for one, uh, I will add that now we do have Kerry Mulstein who is also translates those Egyptian hieroglyphs and he knows what they say and they do not say what Joseph Smith claimed also. And the non-Mormon Egyptologist uh, Rittner, and in Hugh Nibley's day. Hugh Nibley also translated the hieroglyphs, and he knows that Joseph Smith's translation did not match. Uh, and in his day, in the 1960s, the Egyptologist Nibley studied under Klaus Baer also showed that these hieroglyphs translate into the actual words that Egyptologists have always translated them as, and that Joseph Smith's translations do not match. Now, what Gibbons does next is very interesting. He says that uh, the majority of scholarly opinion in some is dismissive, of Smith as an explainer of the three facsimiles, and then he has footnote 204. So I zippity doo da where all the way over here to footnote 204. Uh, and this will be on page 213, and he says here, one exception might be John Gee. Now this is another, now John Gee is the uh, legitimate uh, Egyptology PhD bearing Egyptologist, and he believes that all verdicts on facsimile 3 are premature. Uh, 
Here's how he puts it. He says, most of what has been said about this facsimile is seriously wanting at best and highly erroneous at worst because the basic Egyptological work on facsimile number three has not been done. And much of the evidence lies neglected and unpublished in museums. And he said that in his paper, uh, Facsimile 3 and the Book of the Dead 125, and this is in the book from Guy and Hauglid, Astronomy, Papyrus, and Covenant. And I just happen to have that book myself. So let's look at what John Guy did. Now this is the Astronomy Papyrus and Covenant, edited by John Gee and Brian M. Howard, right? Uh, this was for the series in the studies in the Book of Abraham that kind of went the way of the earth once farms was dismantled. Uh, this was done by farms. This is uh, you know, the third volume for 2005 for the Institute for the Study and Preservation of Ancient Religious Texts, Brigham Young University. Anyway, to get on with it. Chapter 7, that's what I wanted to give you for those of you who have this facsimile 3, and the Book of the Dead, chapter 125. And what I'd like to do is read a few ideas in Guy's material, since he doesn't think any criticism about facsimile number 3 is valid yet. So this is important to check in. What is important to notice is how John Gee cleverly takes our eye off the prize. He's very skillful at this, and I'm going to point this out. Facsimile 3 has always been the most neglected of the three facsimiles in the Book of Abraham. Unfortunately, most of what has been said about this facsimile is seriously wanting at best, and highly erroneous at worst. And here's my note to that. It is irrelevant to the issue, which issue is if Joseph Smith translated it correctly. And the answer is no, he did not. This entire article is designed to keep us from looking at Joseph Smith's incorrect translations of the hieroglyphics in facsimile number three. This entire article is an obfuscation. He is muddying up the waters with absolutely irrelevant Egyptian junk that has nothing to do with the only issue that matters right? This can be tested, and Joseph Smith's translation has been tested, and Joseph Smith failed. That's the issue. Look how careful, and how scholarly, and how impressive John Gee tries to make the Egyptian aspects of facsimile number three relevant, which completely takes our eye off the only problem that matters. Very clever how he does this. Then he goes on, this lamentable state of affairs exists because the basic Egyptological work on facsimile three has not been done. Tut, tut and much of the evidence lies neglected and unpublished in museums. Furthermore, what an ancient Egyptian understood by a vignette, and what a modern Egyptologist understands by the same vignette, are by no means the same thing. We have a problem here, Houston. You see how he's creating an artificial issue that none of us give a fly and flip about in order to not discuss the issue. Isn't that remarkable? And here's what I said. That's not the issue, John. Doesn't matter 
what an Egyptologist thinks. It doesn't matter what an Egyptologist thinks about facsimile number three. What matters is what Joseph Smith thought. Ah. And how he mistranslated the hieroglyphics so grossly inaccurately. That's the issue. Ding, 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 ding. That's what we want to keep our eye on. Watch John Gee masterfully take our eye off the ball again. It's so interesting how he does this. Oh, and as an apologist, man, I ate this stuff up. <laughs> I was throwing this kind of stupid junk at all of you guys when I was being an apologist. Now I'm showing you my refutation of the LDS Egyptologist. He says, until we understand what the Egyptians understood by this scene, we have no hope of telling whether what Joseph Smith said about them matches what the Egyptians thought about them. And my note is, that's just simply not true. We know Joseph Smith had no idea what the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics meant. And then I say, see Robert Rittner's The Joseph Smith Papyri Complete Edition, pages 171 FF, which I happen to have. The Joseph Smith Papyri Complete Edition, and I will get to that in just a moment. Okay? So I'm cross-referencing to what source to go to next. I do this with all my books. It makes it much easier to find my <clears throat> materials. And then I do know all of this is taking our eye off the real issue. So now he goes to the dating of facsimile number three. See, all of these outside, extraneous, uh, superfluous, scholarly issues where he can bring in various Egyptological and historians and, and uh, Assyriologists and ancient religious priests and their sayings, whoever, so that he can put 50 to 60 to 70 footnotes to really make it look like, man, I know what I'm talking about. Check this out. This article has so many footnotes. I'm referencing so many materials in, in French and German and English. And so you can't refute me. This is scholarship. This is the impression that John Gee wants to give us. And at this point, I'm not impressed. I'm really not. I mean, I will concede the point. Yes, John Gee knows more German and French and Egyptian material than I ever will. It has nothing to do with the issue. It's not about what John Gee knows and what he shows off about his knowledge. It's not a matter of what I know. It's not a matter of what you know. It's a matter of what did Joseph Smith translate? And is that translation correct? That's all we want to know. That's it. That's the prize. That's the prize. Okay? So here's John Gee. Facsimile 3 came from the middle of a long roll belonging to a man by the name of Hor, who was the son of Osaurus and Chibois. And he's got a footnote. And, he's, and he starts talking about the roll and the lengths and the different books and so on and so forth. Well, here, Robert Rittner and Cook and Smith completely destroy John Gee's argument. And I will get to that in just a minute. I want to just keep going through a little bit with John Gee here. Because at one time I was very impressed with John Gee. And now I recognize that his entire... And this is so sad. This is so unfortunate. His entire career. One, it's in complete shambles. He, he's been so refuted by absolutely everybody with every hoinky-doinky 
theory he's ever invented to try to save Joseph Smith with this Book of Abraham fiasco. Uh, I mean, I feel, I feel sorry for the guy. But all of this, uh, all of this extra fluff doesn't impress me at all anymore. Everything he ever produced is doing this, right? But he got published. Yeah. So what? Listen to what he says here. This, this is incredible. Well, some have assumed that the, and I'm on page 96, some have assumed that the facsimiles of the book of Abraham were drawn by Abraham himself, and I have written a large paper on that, and I will give you the reference to that. A very, very large paper. And it's not assuming. Joseph Smith absolutely said Joseph or, uh, Abraham wrote those papyri himself. He claimed he had Abraham's actual autograph. He also said he had Moses' actual autograph. That's in the witnesses that talk about seeing the mummy and the papyri in Lucy Mac Smith's home when they were showing off the antiquities in the 1830s and 40s. That's not an assumption. John Gee is trying to soften the impact of what the witnesses themselves heard Joseph Smith tell them. Okay? So, again, he's, he's muddying the waters unnecessarily. Well, this assumption that the Book of Abraham was drawn, the facsimiles were drawn by Abraham himself, this assumption is too simplistic for what we know of the tradition of manuscript illustrations, and he's talking about the Egyptian manuscript illustrations from antiquity and the Egyptologists describing where the illustrations fit with which Egyptian papyri. None of that is relevant to what Joseph Smith was telling the people in Kirtland in the 1830s, however. He was showing these signatures and drawings of the Book of Abraham in the Egyptian papyri, and that's how Joseph Smith was identifying it. So, John Gee, to bring in the controversy with different scholars saying, well, this vignette matches that text, but that one doesn't match this and all, none of that is relevant. John Gee is just simply trying to take our eye off of what Joseph Smith himself thought, taught, said, proclaimed, and translated. The question isn't about what the ancient Egyptians said. The questions aren't about how Egyptologists agree or disagree with the ancient Egyptians. None of that means anything. We want to know about Joseph Smith, right? That's the thing. And then let me keep going. Oh, and then he goes through the judgment scenes, various judgment scenes through the various times. The 19th dynasty, the 18th dynasty. Consistent association with the vignettes, with the judgment in the dead. And on and on and on. This is quite telling, he says, because, and I'm on page 99 now. He says, this is quite telling, as both facsimile 1 and facsimile 3 are assumed to belong to the Book of Breathings, made by Isis because they accompanied the text in the Joseph Smith papyri. Yet the contemporary parallel texts of the Book of Breathings made by Isis, belonging to members of the same family, have different vignettes associated with them. <gasps> what a discovery! Holy cow! Instead of a scene like facsimile number three, most book of breathings made by Isis show a man with his hands raised in adoration to a cow. This indicates that the facsimile of the book of Abraham do not belong to the book of breathings. Can't you understand that? Again, who cares? That has nothing to do with the issue. This is irrelevant. The question is, did Joseph Smith translate them correctly? No, he did not. 
and he placed facsimile number one at the beginning, facsimile number two in the middle, and facsimile number three at the end of the book of Abraham. Joseph Smith said and showed that he believed these facsimiles belonged to this papyri, which in Joseph Smith's translation was the book of Abraham. That's the issue. Joseph Smith was wrong. John Gee doesn't want to arrive at that conclusion. So he brings up all kinds of interesting historical, Egyptological, irrelevant issues, creating problems that are unsolvable, and therefore there's still hope that we can figure this out for Joseph Smith. That's pretty clever, you got to admit. But it's also entirely unconvincing because it takes our eye off the only issue that matters to us. And John Gee knows that. He's being clever, but not honest. No more. And finally, to bring an end to this scholarly, confusing, deliberate uh, problem-making that Gee continues to do throughout pretty much his entire career, but especially in this article, he says, Significantly, these elements are present in a vignette accompanying Book of the Dead, chapter 125, found among the Joseph Smith papyri, as well as other copies of vignettes of the Book of the Dead, chapter 125. These elements are present in all the judgment scenes that the critics would compare with facsimile number three. The elements of the judgment scenes are listed in the demotic Book of the Dead. They are consistent with those of earlier judgment scenes. Their absence from facsimile number three indicates that facsimile number three is not a judgment scene and is not directly associated with the Book of the Dead, 125. That's on page uh, 101. So far from being, as one of the critics claimed, the single most common form of Egyptian funerary scene known, which is not true even of Book of the Dead 125, the real parallels to facsimile number three have not yet been publicly identified. Having established that what facsimile number three is not, however, we are free to look for those real parallels to facsimile number three. And so Guy is presenting us an Egyptological problem that, oh, today's Egyptologists are floundering about. They're lost. They don't know what they're talking about. Only me, John Gee. I know because I've studied this more than them, and therefore there's problems with their approach, and so therefore Joseph Smith's fine. It's that last implication that is blatantly wrong. Again, none of what he says in this article has anything at all to do in any manner with Joseph Smith mistranslating the hieroglyphics in the figures like Brian Howland correctly addressed. Now it's really interesting that Howland does mention in his, in his discussion Robert Rittner's book in footnote 203, and it's on page 212. And Givens, I, I said Hauglid, I meant Gibb, well, Givens and Hauglid, I guess both of them are doing them. I think it's Givens that missed this. Hauglid's too careful of a Book of Abraham scholar. They reference to Rittner, Joseph Smith, Egyptian Papyri, page 149. No, <clears throat> they misreference that. It's on pages 173, 174, and 175. What is their translation of the hieroglyphs? King Pharaoh, whose name is given in the characters above his head that Joseph Smith so wrongly gave us, actually is Isis the Great the God's mother. 
Well, the reference to Rittner they gave uh, is just sloppy because they gave the wrong page number, okay? And stuff like that is important when you're dealing with this papyrite because the very most important response of all responses ever given anywhere on any issue to every Book of Abraham apologist ever in existence is given by Robert Rittner in his absolutely must-have book. The nice thing is, it's in paperback now. I, if I remember right, the hardcover was 90 bucks. <laughs> Some of you can afford that. I, I didn't, so I waited for the paperback. I think it paperback was st it was still 35 bucks but well worth the money let me uh, let me show you uh, uh, that's what I was doing hang on back to Givens and how it after Givens explains that the problematic nature of the facsimile number three has really caused problems for uh, LDS scholars. Uh, Chapel Mormons aren't interested enough to even worry about it. All they want to do is sit there and suck in everything they're told without actually thinking about it, what the brethren in Salt Lake City tell them. They're not going to read excellent scholarly books like this one of Gibbons and Hauglid. <clears throat> for the next several pages after this, very interestingly, these guys talk about complicating the Book of Abraham issue occurred in 1967, which the original papyri that Joseph Smith actually worked from and actually translated into the Book of Abraham came back into the church. And they go on for page after page, and they describe the various issues, uh, the different Theories of LDS scholars, Crapo and Twetness, Nibley, Rhodes, Gee, all of these guys with all of the various issues of how come the translation doesn't match, you know, <laughs> they're floundering in the dark. And then he talks about the Egypticity of the Book of Abraham, and they talk about Nibley's materials and the old stuff from Harold Bloom and how Nibley pointed out the way to save the book of Abraham which failed and so on and so forth. Well they go on and they go through over and over and over the Abraham Egyptian papers and the mechanics of translation and so on and so forth and they conclude that LDS scholars, there are still some LDS scholars who don't think that we yet have the papyri that Joseph Smith translated. And this is John Gee's really stupid and completely refuted ad hoc excuse for Joseph Smith uh, about a longer role. And here is Robert Rittner's definitive put down destruction, as it were, of the LDS apologetic, that we still don't have the actual papyri that Joseph Smith translated the Book of Abraham from. That has been decidedly found to be false. Rittner says, with false restoration, now, um, and this is in his book, and I'm on page 115, 116, and 117, and 118. <laughs> and I'm going to skip and jump a little bit, I think. I might have to read this whole thing because it's so good. With the false restorations and interpretive distortions, Joseph Smith reworked vignette number one, this is the lion count scene in the Book of Abraham, a facsimile from the Book of Abraham number one, the explicit statement that the facsimile is from the Book of Abraham. Abraham refutes any reasonable, as opposed to apologetic skepticism, that Papyrus Joseph Smith No. 1 was the source of the narrative entitled the Book of Abraham, because Joseph Smith himself says this scene, the lion cow scene, is from the Book of Abraham. 
Translated from the Papyrus by Joseph Smith. In addition, the iconography, in fact, simile number one, is repeatedly cited within the Book of Abraham narrative itself. That you may have a knowledge of this altar, I will refer you to the representation at the commencement of this record, that's Abraham 1.12, right? After introducing a series of idolatrous gods, Abraham 1.13, Abraham is made to say that you, you the reader, may have an understanding of these gods. I have given you the fashion of them in the figures at the beginning. I described them at the beginning, which manner of figures is called by the Chaldeans Ralinos, which signifies hieroglyphics, Abraham 1.14. Of course, of course. He's blowing smoke, but it sounded impressive. In these citations, now here's the understanding, here's what you don't get from the apologists that you do get from the genuine Egyptologist. In these citations, the imagery on Papyrus Joseph Smith No. 1 is said to stand just before, that is, at the commencement, the beginning of the text of Abraham. This is Joseph Smith's description of the papyri that he had. And he said, Fashima No. 1 is at the beginning of this record. So that the adjacent book of breathings of horror was Joseph Smith's source. Facsimile number one is not in the middle of a scroll like John Gee stupidly lied about. It's at the beginning and the papyrus of Hor is not a separate and now lost addition at the end of the scroll. It's also at the beginning. And facsimile number one was hooked to papyrus Joseph Smith number one before it was either cut off or tore off. They've matched the fibers. So the text that Joseph Smith translated said, look at the beginning of it at the vignette. And that was facsimile number one. That's why we know we have the actual papyri Joseph Smith translated from. Because it's the one that was given back in 1967. It's also the one where he took bits of hieroglyphs, put them in a column, and then put verses of Abraham next to each one of those glyphs while he was translating them. Those are Papyrus Joseph Smith number one that was next to facsimile number one, which was the illustration that Abraham was giving, according to Joseph Smith. That's why we know we have the actual original. It's not on a lost scroll. The papyri we have matches Joseph Smith's own description. That's critical. That's what Mormonism doesn't want you to know. Uh, uh, uh. No, sir. They will try to come up with every balderdash, raw, idiotic theory they can to distract us from the real issue. Yeah? Thank God for Egyptologists who keep us straight. Yeah. So, anyway, he goes on. Anyway, yeah, that, that was the main issue I wanted to get out of... Uh, Robert Rittner on that, uh, refuting John Gee, no question. I mean, Rittner's, Rittner's material just destroys Rhodes, Nibley, Gee, Molstein. I mean, he's a one-man wrecking crew, man. He just wipes them out. It is astonishing how badly he destroys the LDS apologetics. But wait, there's more. Man, there is just so much to this subject. There is one more theme that I want to share with you, and then if you like this subject, I mean, it's been done like crazy. Uh, John DeLynn and, and uh, Radio Free Mormon have done a 13-hour interview, a series of videos with Robert Rittner himself going through all the details. It's absolutely magnificent. 
I don't think they had access to this book, The Pearl of Greatest Price, so that's where the value of my particular video here comes in, because I haven't seen anyone talk about this book yet. This is the newest, 2019, just a couple years ago, the newest attempt to once again try to salvage something of the fiasco of the Book of Abraham, and it utterly fails. It just, they can't do it. And unfortunately, Gibbons ignores that part of Robert Rittner's response about the original Papyri. Uh, all he talks about is the various LDS attempts to show that we don't have the original Papyri. He wants to make it questionable that we actually have the original Papyri. Robert Rittner absolutely fundamentally demonstrates without question that we do have the actual Papyri, Joseph Smith tried to translate, and I will say one more thing, my very good friend H. Michael Marquart was asked also to contribute a historical chapter in Rittner's book. Rittner asked H. Michael Marquart to contribute to this, which is a hell of an honor for Marquart, <clears throat> and Marquart just rose to the challenge. His, his chapter Joseph Smith's Egyptian Papers, A History, is absolutely sensational. You must get this book, if for nothing else, H. Michael Marquardt's analysis. Uh, Rittner's just decimated. There is one other thing I want to show you. On Shade's, Dr. Shade's message board, it's called DiscussMormonism.com In the Celestial Forum, my friend who goes by the handle Shulam, yeah, Shulam, the waiter, in fact, simile number three, has a series, and the name of this particular thread that Shulam has made is King Pharaoh, whose name is given in the characters above his head. I would highly recommend you come on to the message board, DiscussMormonism.com, and come and look that up. Now, we do have a lot of discussions in the Terrestrial Forum as well. In the Celestial Forum, we keep it uh, more gentlemanly and scholarly. And technically, that's not true because the terrestrial has some amazing scholarship by people who are critical thinkers, who analyze the Mormon claims, etc. Come and look this up. This is impressive. Here is what Shulam has said, and he's got several, several posts on this, giving all the history, the analysis, the Egyptological look at it, etc., it's really well done. The figure two person in facsimile number three is Isis. She is a goddess. She is immortal. She is a queen. She is a woman. She is a wife and a mother. She is not a king, as Joseph Smith said. She is not a pharaoh, as Joseph Smith said. She is not a mortal, as Joseph Smith said. And she is not a man, as Joseph Smith said. Shulam really brings out the explicit details of how badly Joseph Smith blew it in bragging that he was translating the hieroglyphics. And I choose my word deliberately. I'm not obfuscating here. Shulam also points out, Kerry Mulstein, another LDS Egyptologist who banters around the country, pulling out all kinds of stops and fibs and innuendos to try to save Joseph Smith, in his article, i got to take a deep breath because he's so gosh dang huge, titled, long-winded, just like his article is, Assessing the Joseph Smith Papyri, an introduction to the historiography of their acquisitions, translations, and interpretations. You know, he, he must think that long titles means you're going to be impressed with his scholarship or something. I'm honestly not. 
Here's what Mulstein said. Joseph Smith did not claim to be able to read the hieroglyphics. And I say, bullshit. I don't care if Mulstein has a PhD in Egyptology, Hittology, Hebrew, Greek, Iranian, and Native American Navajo. That's bullshit, what he just said. And we can prove it. Shulam shows that Joseph Smith told Josiah Quincy, who happened to publish his account of his visit to Joseph Smith. Hey, and Joseph Smith, seeing such a very important American diplomat, of course, come on in, come on in. He took him right up to Lucy Mack Smith's home and showed him the mummies, and he laid out the papyri, and he was bragging about how much he knew and, and what he had. Here's what Joseph Smith told Josiah Quincy, who then published this. He said, pointing to one of the hieroglyphics, Joseph Smith said, this is the handwriting of Abraham, and that of Moses. These are hieroglyphs nobody can read but myself. I can read all the writings, and the hieroglyphs. Joseph Smith said that. Kerry Molstein is so desperate, he has to present a bald-faced historical falsehood. And I called him out on it. Of course, Shulam has been calling out Mulstein and Gee and Nibley and Rhodes and all of the other. For decades, he's been saying, hey, what's the name of the king? In fact, simile number three, because he's got this exactly right. They can't tell you Joseph Smith got it right because Joseph Smith didn't get it right, but he claims to be able to. So Joseph Smith's lying. That's what Mormonism doesn't want you to know. They're hiding the truth from us. And we, I promise, we have a boatload of evidence to show that. Now that's remarkable. Even Gibbons fudges by not giving all of the information from Robert Rittner, for instance, there's another area that Givens does not quote. So far as I can tell in his book, he only uses Robert Rittner once, and he ignores this part of what Robert Rittner has to say about the interpretation of facsimile number three. The explanations of, and this is on page 171, Rittner, the bona fide, the real Egyptologist, says, the explanations of facsimile number three offered by Joseph Smith are fanciful in the extreme. As several of Smith's explanations state explicitly, they are based on his understanding of the text. See, even Rittner catches that. Mulstein has to outright lie and say Joseph Smith never claimed it, and yet Rittner has found it. Yeah, he said it, of course given in the characters above his head. Of course he was reading the hieroglyphs. He defines it. He shows you where it's found, as written above the hand, or as represented by the characters above his hand. That's in the Joseph Smith explanations in fact simile number three. See, Kerry Mulstein, he's not fooling anybody. He couldn't fool a sixth grader. All the sixth grader has to do is look at the facsimile number three. And you can see Joseph Smith is pretending to translate the hieroglyphs, right? But it takes an adult who wants to strengthen testimony in order to have to lie in order to get you to believe in Joseph Smith. And I find that so astonishingly odd. Because it doesn't matter if it's the book of Abraham, it doesn't matter if it's about polygamy, it doesn't matter if it's about the celestial kingdom, it doesn't matter if it's about the book of Mormon, it doesn't matter what it's about. 
They're constantly having to fudge the historical record to manipulate the historical record. They have to either lie and leave something out, or they have to lie and add something in. Some truths are not very useful. I don't trust the historians, according to Boyd K. Packer. No doubt you don't trust the historians because you're fudging it in order to validate Joseph Smith. You can't just let the simple truth validate Mormonism. You have to manipulate it. And it almost doesn't matter what subject. For me, I find that peculiarly odd. Don't you? Yeah. I mean, for real. No other religion has to do this that I'm aware of. Yeah, except the Catholics. Yeah, well, the Baptists. <laughs> All right, the, the Lutherans, the Jews, the Episcopalians, the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, the Presbyterians. You get the point. Yeah, right? Okay, so, facsimile number three provides indisputable evidence that Joseph Smith had absolutely no abilities to read or translate Egyptian or even derive accurate information from Egyptian images. He could not distinguish deities from humans, females from males, or even humans from animal figures. That's on page 171. And there's much more on page 172, 173, and in the notes um, where he really backhands and slaps and puts Guy in his place. Guy lacks entirely any kind of scholarly credibility. Uh, he just, oh, he just massacres him. But that's the part of Rittner's book that even Givens won't go to. So see, they're leaving out stuff. They have to. They have to. When you want the truth, by all means, read the LDS scholars just realize your work's not done once you read them. Because you must critically assess and think through what they're saying. You must check their sources. You must <laughs> on every subject, really, truly. That's why the Mormon Discussions dot com. Uh, Dr. Shade's message board is really good because we really do. We have professional doctors, professional historians, philosophers, statisticians, and then we've got a whole bunch of us other country bumpkin boys who just really love to learn and mix it up and study and share and try to demonstrate why uh, the Mormons saying 2 plus 2 is 379.58275 might be slightly inaccurate. We do that on every subject because it happens on every subject. It's astonishing. It really is. So, My point is, be happy that there are ways of figuring out the true from the false. There really are. You don't have to be stuck wondering. And what this does is it takes the fear away that I'm being deceived. I might be being deceived. I'm not quite sure, but man, how do I find out? Yeah. So, that's what I wanted to present to you. My reason why, yet again, one of the very most recent apologists uh, Terrell Givens, in one of the most very recent, really well done scholarly texts, is still demonstrating the Mormon modus operandi of manipulation. Dishonest manipulation. And I'm sorry to have to say that, because Givens is a good guy. He is. He's a nice guy. But that doesn't justify him always trying to manipulate the evidence in his favor so deliberately, and he knows better. He knows better, man. He's under the thumb of the leadership 
who has already dictated to all of their scholars at BYU or whatever university that an LDS scholar works at, these are the parameters you're allowed to work within, and these are the subjects you can study out, and these are the conclusions you can arrive at, anything else, and BAM! We're kicking your sorry butts out. You're coming in. You're gonna get grilled. We have the Inquisition. We will find out if you have a testimony or not. And it's got them all terrified and quailed, and so they just follow the brethren. They write for one reason, to follow the brethren. We have to be disciple scholars. We have to follow the brethren, and we have to agree with the brethren. That's what Fair Mormon became. That's why their material is so stupid and crappy now. It wasn't that way when I started it, but they wanted to please the brethren. I mean, Scott Gordon told me that flat out. He said, oh yeah, if the brethren say pull the plug, we're quitting. I said, over my dead body? And he said, well, we can kick you out too if you want. And I started the organization. I wanted it to be independent of Salt Lake City because I knew they were going to put the pressure on to conform. Not think, conform. And I can't stand that. I want to let the evidence lead to where the truth is. Mormon apologetics doesn't do that. Mormon brethren don't do that. And chapel Mormons don't know that. That's what Mormonism's hiding from us. So, Anyway, that's enough. I'm preaching. You guys be good, do well, have fun, be happy. Love one another. I know, so that, that's a hard one, you know. It is. I, I'm not going to lie to you. But that's critical, too. Be friends. Be kind. It's fun. Be kind. You know, help out a brother a little. Yes, the dirty, filthy, stinking, jobless bum out there on the corner is probably a damn leftist liberal Democrat. So let him rot. Uh, you Mormons who think that, you ain't even going to get to the T-Lestial. And you think I'm kidding? Maybe you better get off your dead asses and reread your own scriptures. Start with Jesus, would you? Just an idea, you know. Anyway, I love you all. I appreciate you as my audience. I will be back with more good information. And in the meantime, thanks for watching the Backyard Professor videos.